it's a real honor to be here today and I, it's really a, um, it's great that I can actually be here even though I'm not there um, and this technology is fantastic except when it doesn't work so um, but I've learned that if something's not working technology wise and I'm the least IT person probably on this call um, the thing that always seems to work is shut it down and reopen it and restart and that always seems to do the trick. So that's um, when you go on the iPhone helpline, that's the first thing it tells you. Um, so um, it's lovely that um, cousin or great uncle Brandon can be on. So we, 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 we joke about this family relationship, but it's actually, it actually goes to the heart of what Brandon is saying is that we've become such a close knit community in pediatric brain cancer that we literally feel like we're family. So we have a network of uncles and cousins throughout the world and kind of started with me and um, the professor of uh, um, pediatric neuro-oncology in Newcastle University, uh, Colin Amar Gaja, who is undisputedly the best neuro-oncologist in the world, uh, calling him uncle. And that's where it was. this was born. Anyway, I won't drone on. I'll share my screen and uh, we can um, uh, start the talk and I can share with you some of um, our experience at translating um, drugs into the clinic uh, for pediatric brain cancer. Can you guys all see my screen? Uh, Fernando, maybe if you nod, or Nicole, I can see you nodding. Thank you. Yeah, it's helpful right. at least to still have a, a visible audience. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I will get, oh, actually, I, th this first picture here I, I stole from St. Jude, but I think encapsulates everything I'm about to say uh, as a clinician who looks after children with cancer and a scientist who's trying to find new treatments is this is a little child from St. Jude and that's one of the old St. Jude labs they're much fancier than what they are there now and you can see the child is hooked up to his chemo pole and he's wandering past the labs and the beauty of St. Jude's setup is that the labs and the clinic it's all in the one building and they all have food in the same cafeteria and the scientists mingle with the patients and the doctors and the nurses and the cleaners, everyone together. And this little guy here is clutching his teddy and you can see him looking at the scientists there and what he's looking for is hope for a cure. So, and this photo really says it all because these children have placed their trust in us as the scientists and the clinicians to make things better for them and to cure them of these dreadful diseases that I'm about to tell you about now. So I'll start with just introducing my lab. So it's been really hard to try and get the whole group together in one spot. So I have a series of photos here um, that show who the different people are. And I've tried to credit the different people who have done different components of this work, which has taken years and years and years uh, to put together. But I really wanted to point out the, the backbone of the operation, which is really in Endersby, and um, she's a cousin as well, or sister to me, I guess, but a cousin to Brandon. And uh, Raylan, you can see his picture there in, um, in two of the main photos. Uh, and uh, me and her co lead the brain tumor research program. The other important person is our brain surgeon, Sharon Lee, uh, again, showing how there's this close relationship between the clinic. Uh, and the laboratory. And of course, um, we all know that without funding, none of this happens. So I've put all our different funding bodies here as well, and I'll credit them again at the end. But um, we've been quite lucky lately at getting funding, but that is not always the case. And you guys know that you can scratch around for years, you get more rejections than acceptance. And it's, I've learned in this job, it's perseverance. And uh, um, that seems to pay off. So many of you here know a lot about brain cancer. I mean, Brandon knows more about it than me. Uh, he kind of discovered the hedgehog pathway. So he's a kind of a grandmaster of this disease at the science level. But um, at the clinical level, um, the, the bottom line is this disease now kills more children than any other disease in the world um, uh, in developed countries. And that wasn't always the case, um, but as in survival has improved for other cancers, and the survival has stagnated for brain tumors, um, we've taken over. And this is not a title that you want to have, especially when 
brain cancer represents 20% of childhood cancer, uh, second only to leukemias. So um, this is a title that we want to get rid of uh, and we want to achieve the same survival rates for brain tumors as we do for the most common leukemia, which is lymphoblastic, which is up to 95% for some of the, uh, the more common subgroups. Now, of course, brain cancer is not one disease. It's actually over a hundred different types of diseases. And we've each, each disease that are multiple different subgroups. I'm going to focus today on the one that I've spent a lot of my life working on. Uh, and it's certainly the one that Brandon has spent a lot of his life working on, especially the red type there that's shown in this graph uh, cartoon um, is medalloblastoma. Uh, it's the most common malignant brain cancer of childhood. It's actually in some ways our most successful one that we are at treating it uh, with survival rates um, on average somewhere around 70%. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole story at all. Um, what we've learned over the past decade and a half now uh, started in the early 2000s with um, Scott Pomeroy from Harvard um, publication on gene expression profiles is that actually uh, it's, it's a constellation of different diseases molecularly. So they look the same under the microscope, but molecularly they actually group into four main subgroups, although each of the subgroups splits off many times, but there are these four subgroups known as Wnt, Hedgehog, Group 3, and Group 4. And I'm not going to labor this at, in, in great detail, other than to say it's important because it's not just an academic exercise in splitting these molecularly, they actually are clinically significant. So the kids given the same treatment with the different molecular subgroups will have different outcomes from extremes of 90 to 100% for the wind subgroups down to less than 20%, sometimes 0% uh, for some of the worst players like Hedgehog with P53 mutation or group three with MIC amplification. So currently we apply a blunt instrument to treat these tumors and boy, is it, is it a powerful blunt instrument. Uh, it starts off with surgery, neurosurgery to try and resect as much of the tumor as possible. We then follow it up with intensive radiotherapy to the whole brain and spinal cord, followed by a cocktail of potent, largely DNA damaging agents uh, to try and smash the disease. Uh, and this treatment can go anything from six to 12 months, depending on which protocol you're being treated on. Uh, and as I've said, it, it is frequently successful, but God, does it leave a lot of damage. Um, and that's one of the issues is that the survivors pay a price for that survival and they pay a high price. The younger they are, the higher the radiation dose, the more significant the damage it leaves them with massive losses in IQ, of memory problems, attention problems, endocrinopathies, um, bone problems, hearing problems, and devastatingly, and I've been in, the, in this job long enough now to have seen it several times, some of the kids beat one disease like medallo, and then 10 years later, they get a second hit, a second cancer. Uh, and now I've seen two of my own patients have this. It is the most devastating thing when you have to tell them that they now have an incurable brain tumor, which is a high grade glioma because of the treatment that we gave them. Um, this has to change. We cannot continue like this. So what are we doing about it? Well, for the good players, uh, which are what we call the WINT subgroup, we are now molecularly identifying these patients. And because they're doing so well, we're trying to remove some of the more toxic elements of the treatment, particularly the radiation dose and some of the more toxic elements of the chemo, which tend to be the vincristine and the cisplatinum. And there are three protocols I'm showing you here. One is actually my own as part of the children's oncology group. One is the European one, which is um, uh, led by a dear friend, Francois Dawes, who's one of the nicest people you could ever meet. And then uncle study, uh, who's I've already said, the best neuro-oncologist in the world, uh, Amar Gajau, I was fortunate enough to train under. And that is what we're doing for the WINT patients. Now for the group three, group fours, especially the group threes that are doing very badly, 
uh, this group needs something different, something novel. Amar currently has a study which we have opened here in Perth. You guys have got open at uh, uh, Queensland Children's, it used to be known as Lady Salento, but I know you got rid of good old Lady Salento for some reason. Uh, and now it's Queensland Children's. And um, uh, that's led by my cousin, Tim Hassel. Uh, and he um, has been a long-standing member of the Alliance with, with Amar now. And through laboratory work done by a dear collaborator of ours, Martine Roussel, uh, uh, two new chemos were identified in preclinical studies to be specific for group three disease. Uh, and that was added in and that's gemcitabine and pemetrexate. And that is currently what I am treating my patients with here in Perth. Uh, I've just had one kid finish last week uh, this particular study for a, an aggressive metastatic, uh, he's a seven-year-old, uh, group three MIC amplified tumor. Um, so present day. So I'm going to do the present, the past, and, and then hopefully the future. But the present day is that we've now set up this global alliance uh, and Brandon again, discuss this about how we're so close. Uh, this one is an alliance that occurred through a meeting that both Brandon and I attend every year. It's in terrible locations like Obergoogle in Austria or Whistler in Canada. It, the, I don't know why they select so dreadful locations. Uh, we do a little bit of skiing, although Brandon usually doesn't ski with us. He normally writes grants. Like he's in these amazing places and he, go, he goes off and writes grants. So um, that's how dedicated Brandon is. But we formed this alliance and this meeting really is where we share early data, early ideas in an open forum, uh, no barriers, no secrets. And that's how this alliance was formed. And there's uh, my favorite person in the world, apart from my wife and my children, is Dr. Gajah or my Gajah. And all these others I consider very close friends. Uh, this guy here, I don't know if you can see me pointing, but Amaz, um, the guy with the mustache and the glasses. And then uh, next to him is Giles. Next to him is Clinton, uh, Stuart Clinton, Martin Roussel. And then you've got Stefan and Olaf, which are from Germany. Stefan is an absolute powerhouse in brain tumors. Like, he's just amazing. Uh, and this work that I'm about to show you culminated in this trial called St. Jude Elliot, uh, which we named in honor of the little boy called Elliot, which I'm gonna show in the next slide. But it basically, it's a phase one, phase one B trial, looking at the inclusion of Prexacertib, also known as LY2606368, on the backbone of either gemcitabine or, or cyclophosphamide, and it's looking at the safety of being able to deliver this novel treatment. And it is for relapsed, either group three or group four children with medalloblastoma or sonic hedgehog medalloblastoma. You will notice that for the hedgehog patients, they're only eligible for stratum A, which is with the cyclophosphamide arm, and they're not eligible for the stratum B, which is prexacertib in combination with gemcitabine. And this study actually opened um, last year now and, and we've had a three patients in Australia. The first one was in Perth back in January of this year. And uh, I will ex to tell you why we don't use this, the gemcitabine arm for the hedgehog patients to come. This is the little boy that inspired the work and whom this work is in honor of. Uh, Elliot is no longer with us, uh, but his parents wanted to change this situation and they commenced an incredible fundraising campaign, which actually was how our lab here in Perth was born back in the 2009-ish um, time. Uh, it's how I was able then to recruit Raylene from St. Jude's. Um, so, and we wanted to name the trial in honor of this little boy because he did inspire this work. And it all started with this meeting, uh, which uh, Uncle Brandon was at. Uh, and, this meeting was basically a round table meeting, uh, which was the second of these medulloblastoma niche meetings. The first one having occurred at Lake Tahoe. This is the second one having occurred in Perth. This one we called medulloblastoma down under because we couldn't call it medulloblastoma in the mountains because if you know Perth, there's no mountains. There's a few hills, but there are no mountains. Uh, and at the time of year that we held it, there was certainly no skiing. In fact, 
it doesn't snow here, so you couldn't ski even if it was peak winter. But the meeting basically solidified this collaborative spirit that was at the time in its early infancy, where we were breaking down the silos of, you know, competing and not sharing data and, you know, all making the same discoveries at the same time and coming up with an action plan of, well, how are we going to work together to destroy this disease effectively? Because the pre previous model just wasn't working. And I highlight here that we took on the challenge of working through uh, these novel, then novel high throughput drug screening techniques, which had been uh, taken from pharma, uh, which previously nobody else could afford to do because they were $20 million machines, but they'd been miniaturized to about a million to $2 million machines. And we now had access to high throughput drug screening. And this at the time was in the infancy of these fancy genetic mouse models or PDX models, patient derived xenograph models of uh, different brain tumor types. So uh, our guiding principles were actually very straightforward. And I always feel like I teach in granny to suck eggs when I mention these, but sometimes you do have to go back to basics that we know in medulloblastoma, as in the vast majority of pediatric tumors, uh, certainly solid tumors, not so much for leukemia, uh, but certainly almost all of the brain cancers only give you one opportunity to cure them. And that's at, when you first treatment. The exception to that rule is if you don't use radiation at the beginning, you can salvage patients with radiotherapy. And those patients would be like the babies who you don't want to use it on. So, uh, but by and large, you, if you've got a seven-year-old and you've treated them with frontline standard treatment, which includes craniospinal radiation, that patient, if he, he or she relapses, is incurable of this disease. Um, and we know that if we want to bring a new drug to clinical trial, we're not going to suddenly throw away all these other treatments that we've currently got. We may want to try and remove them or reduce some of them, but we can't suddenly just bring in something brand new and say, yep, this is now going to cure everyone because it just doesn't work like that. Uh, so we knew that we were, whatever we were going to bring, we would be bringing on the backbone of current treatment, which is why we call it the backbone. And that we know that no single agent, as much as we want it to be the case, uh, one treatment you know, even BRAF inhibitors or NTRAC inhibitors, which are so phenomenally powerful, they're not curing the disease by and large. They're, the disease is responding beautifully, but when you stop them, the disease recurs. So it's not cure, it's like living with the disease. Um, and the cornerstone really of childhood cancer treatment is combination chemotherapy. In fact, in leukemia, we use like 10, 12 different types of chemos. So that was the principle on which we built our hypothesis and our pipeline. And I just show you here, and Brandon's doing exactly the same uh, in Queensland, and there are people doing it all over the world now. This is a pretty standard where you take a patient sample. There's our beautiful surgeon, Dr. Sharon, uh, taking the tumor out of one of our patients. It gets banked for genomic analysis, gets sent all over the world. Um, for methylation, for classification. It gets implanted in the mice and it also gets cultured. Uh, we create these avatars, basically, these PDX models. Uh, and we believe these are um, about as close as you're going to be able to mimic the disease. Of course, no model is perfect. And so what, what we try and do is a, use a different range of models uh, because they all come with some disadvantages. The disadvantage of PDX models is the obvious thing is that it's an, it's an immune compromised host, the mouse. Uh, and so we're not getting the effect of the immune system in, in any of our treatments. And now that immunotherapy is becoming so prominent, these models obviously are quite weak in that area. So we have to now remake them all with immune competent, but that's a different story for a different day. Um, and so that is how uh, the story started with the meeting. We had set up, or we were in the process of setting up this high throughput drug screen, which we did in collaboration with the CCI over in um, Sydney Chil uh, uh, Children's Cancer Institute over in Sydney. Uh, and uh, out of this drug screen, it was about 3,600 compounds, uh, largely compounds that were easily translatable. In other words, they weren't like, you know, chemicals that were found at the bottom of volcanoes or, you know, deep in the oceans, which, you know, would take 20, 30 years to bring to clinical trial. Uh, and it may be that that's where the cure lies. And that's 
some of the high throughput drug screening that St. Jude are doing. But what we were doing wanted to screen compounds that were readily translatable, that had had uh, either safety data already present or had been developed for adult cancer and then could be tested in children. Uh, and we tested six different uh, cell lines for medulloblastoma that we had. So we, we got as many on our hands as we could at the time. And that was actually quite a large number for, for, for its day. I mean, nowadays you can get your hands on probably on a lot more, but when we started this work, which was in 2012, 2013, and you could see how long these stories take, um, that was how many we could get our hands on. And we saw there was about 50 hits, which is about 1.5% was, um, uh, killed the cells uh, at clinically a reasonable concentrations, less than one micromolar. Uh, and um, out of these 3,600 agents in all the different cell lines. So we wanted to find something that was potent in all the different lines. And they were all representative of group three because you can't grow hedgehog uh, cell lines, for example. So they were all group three and, and they by and large were MIC amplified or MIC gained type tumors. So they were the more aggressive versions of the type I showed you earlier on. And what struck us was how inhibitors of the cell cycle in one guise or other were enriched in this uh, high throughput drug screen that we undertook. And for example, Brandon has spent now several years and we're working with him and I've got a slide at the end to show this on um, the CDK4-6 cell cycle inhibitors. Uh, that came up as well independently on our cycle. And interestingly, genomic work that Uncle Brandon was doing at the time identified using an independent um, analysis of this type. So it was sort of a high throughput genomic screen, if you like. And I'm sure Laura has presented this data to you guys before. Beautiful work. And because Brandon and I sh share and with Raylene and, um, and Laura data all the time that the check, in check one, check two inhibitors, which we sort of decided to work on, came up independently in Brandon's screen as it did in our high throughput drug screen. And equally, we found uh, the cell cycle in CDK4-6 inhibitors came up. So did polar-like kinase inhibitors and also inhibitors of the PI3 kinase pathway. There were some other hits that were interesting that kind of led us, because at the time we didn't know how good this high throughput drug screening was, to be honest. And uh, some of the early pioneers, which was French St. Jude, had identified certain um, compounds, which also came up on our screen, which gave us some comfort that we had hit upon something that we thought was genuine. And gemcitabine came up, you can see it there. Uh, it came up in Martine Roussel's screen. And our friend and collaborator, Rob wetzler in San Diego at the Sanford Burnham Institute, he had identified HDAC inhibitors and PI3 kinase pathway inhibitors as well. So we thought we were probably onto something and we settled on the check. Uh, so the DNA damage response pathway is the one we were going to look at. And uh, basically when a cell, a cancer cell is damaged, uh, and obviously we deliberately try and damage these cells using either chemo or radiation, um, the cells can go into a, a state of arrest uh, where they then can repair this damage by activating this very complex pathway, which I'm not going to take you through, but um, which check one and check two are, are key players fairly early on in the pathways you can see on the schematic diagram there. And the first hurdle we had to cross though was there are umpteen of these different check one, check two inhibitors and which one do we take to the clinic? Like I, I had no preference for a drug company. So we just tested as many as we could get our hands on. Uh, so we tested them from AstraZeneca, from Merck, the, the one from Eli Lilly. We couldn't get our hands at the time on the Genentech uh, versions. And to cut a long story short, we basically compared them head to head and using a series of uh, in vitro and in vivo experiments, which included combina combinatorial in vitro experimentation, looking for synergism uh, as our primary endpoint to indicate that we were not going to nullify the effect of chemotherapy, which was our, remember our guiding principle, where well, we were gonna take this treatment hopefully into the clinic. And if you're gonna take it into the clinic, the last thing you wanna do is 
negate the effect of the treatment you're already using. So the, one of the first things we wanted, at least additivity, if not synergism, that's the, the in vitro drug testing graph that results have got there showing you that there is a shift in the curve when you combine uh, the agents uh, showing that there's uh, synergism. And then we did in vitro modeling uh, using our mouse models with one of our backbone models, which is uh, actually a, a patient derived cell line, which was implanted like a PDX into the mouse brain. And the survival studies are shown there. This is quite a complex curve, but the, the long and the short was that Brexacertib, which was the Eli Lilly compound, came out as uh, one of the most potent. So, uh, the AstraZeneca one wasn't actually far behind, but AstraZeneca shelved that compound because of a clinical trial result from Japan and there was no way they were releasing it. So it was a, became a moot point that even though it wasn't far behind uh, in the survival, as you can see in the graph B, uh, which is a summary of the survival curves, um, we couldn't take it forward anyway. So we uh, selected the LY2606368, which is known as Prexacertib, easier to say. So the other major challenge uh, which um, <clears throat> Brandon will attest to uh, is you can have the most potent drugs in the world that kill all brain cancer cells that they're exposed to, but and that's all good, well and good in vitro and in a model, but if it doesn't actually get to its target and the brain has got this thing called the blood-brain barrier around it, which stops many drugs getting into it. And in fact, many pharmaceutical companies deliberately select for drugs that do not cross the blood-brain barrier because they do not want the side effects. Um, one of our first things we did was, well, actually, we didn't do it because I don't understand this stuff. It's really complex. Uh, but Clinton Stewart is a brilliant pharmacologist and pharm PK specialist. And he has developed this microdialysis technique where he actually can measure the intratumoral concentration of drug. And look at all these fancy formulas. And those of you that can understand them, I take my hat off to you because this really is very complex stuff. But it's really important because I believe this is one of the single biggest issues why we are not defeating a lot of these tumors is that we're doing some good preclinical work. We're finding some great drugs but many of them just do not reach the target in high enough concentrations to kill the tumors or for long enough. And therefore, it doesn't matter how good they are in their preclinical models, they're just not getting to the tumor in the children. And so we knew that it was getting into the tumors based on Clinton's work, which he then published you know, recently, sort of in a uh, pharmacology-like journal, showing that it did reach concentrations in the tumor that were achievable in the children uh, in the clinic uh, that should lead to tumor kill. So we were confident that we could leap forward with this. Please don't ask me any questions about any of these equations because I will not know the answer. I'll just put it out there now. Um, so we then uh, did um, some early studies looking, well, this Prexatertib, does it hit the target um, in our tumors? And what I'm showing you here is a immunostochemistry uh, IHC of some tumor showing control, the Prexa by itself, cyclophosphamide by itself, and then cyclophosphamide in combination for phospho check one, which obviously is what we're trying to inhibit. And what you see is that, yes, it does inhibit. Now, the reason it goes up is because inhibition of check one stops activation of this enzyme called PP2A, which normally removes the phosphate from the S345, uh, which is the phosphor check one. So when check one is inhibited, the phosphorylation of S345 goes up. So that is why you're seeing the increase, which is appropriate, but it kind of seems paradoxical. So we knew we were getting the target, the check one, and we also wanted to really, to be sure, to be sure, uh, we checked, well, what about the downstream target of check one and two, which is CDC2? And yes, we saw that in this instance, um, we got um, prevents CDC2 
2 phosphorylation because CDC2 is activated by DNA damage. If you add a DNA damaging inhibitor, once you've damaged the DNA, i.e. when you've given cyclophosphamide, denoted as CPA, you get this inhibition. You can cl clearly see there's less brown and the graph sort of depicts it in a way that um, you can see it um, numerically. And the next thing we wanted to look at was, well, what effect will we have in on DNA damage? So we looked at gamma H2AX and we looked at apoptosis and we used Cleese caspase free as the marker for apoptosis. Uh, this is all fairly standard stuff. And we did this in a number of different models. I'm just showing you here representation of a model from a group free PDX. Um, and also a model from a Sonic Hedgehog PDF showing the very same story that um, you're getting uh, increased apoptosis as denoted by cleave caspase free in both the Hedgehog model and the group three model. And it's depicted in a summary in, in the graph at the end, that's the purple um, with the combination and you're getting an increase in uh, double-stranded DNA damage as denoted by gamma H2AX. So we knew we were hitting the target and we were having a pharmacogenomic effect, a biological effect on the tumors. And of course, all this is well and good, but what were we doing uh, to the survival? Because in the end, we're not just looking for a biological effect, we're looking for a survival effect. So, this just shows you our workflow schema for how we do this. And it's not too dissimilar to what uh, Brandon does in, in um, cause again, we share everything um, over in Queensland, but we basically treat the mice in uh, this fashion where we implant the tumors. We ensure that the tumors have taken, uh, that the uh, tumors are a, a, a certain size before we start treatment so that, um, we know we're not biasing results by treating mice too early or too late, whichever way you want to bias things, that there's a there's a reproducible way of doing it. Uh, and uh, we may monitor the mice because all of the tumors have got um, luciferase. Um, and so it, I call it a poor man's MRI, but it allows us to measure uh, using bioluminescence, how much tumor burden the mice have. And then we commence treatment. And you can see there we give control, you give chemo by itself, which can either be cyclo or gemcitabine. You give the, act, the new agent by itself, which this instance is prexaterbitib, and then you give them in combination as well with the chemo and the prexacertib. And then we monitor the mice for toxicity. We monitor the mice for uh, tumor response, and we do that by measuring the bioluminescence on a weekly basis. And that just shows you an example. And then ultimately we're monitoring survival of these mice. How do, do they live longer uh, because of this treatment? And I'll put it out there, whilst we have obviously increased survival significantly and that graph there shows you, you'll see that all the mice do succumb to their disease. So we haven't found a cure here. We're not actually able to treat the mice more than about six weeks anyway, because of toxicity gets in the way. Uh, with these agents. And we can talk about that if we like at the end. So for cyclophosphamide, we run numerous different um, experiments. Uh, and this is where the collaboration really came in. So we teamed up with Martin's lab at St. Jude and um, Rob Wetscheleo's lab at, uh, in San Diego at Sanford Burnham in, in, um, Institute. And um, they um, independently tested in some of their models uh, in exactly the same way, uh, the combinations that we were treating in, in Perth. And I'll just show you a summary here. Uh, the graphs basically show uh, where vehicle is in gray or sort of light black. Uh, red is your um, lily compound, prexacertib. Blue is your cyclophosphamide. Uh, and then purple denotes the combination of cyclophosphamide with prexacertib. And you can see that in every model here, there is an increase in survival, uh, particularly for the purple is the best. Now, in some of them, you can see that the cyclophosphamide, the blue is quite effective, and in others, it's not that effective. Uh, so we're clearly seeing an improvement on the survival curves for these mice with a treated recombination therapy, which is what we'd hoped, and the last, uh, one in the corner just shows you an example of how we've plotted 
the BLI measurements, which is the bioluminescence measurement, which is your poor man's MRI showing um, that for the controls, there's an increase of, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but anyway, there's an increase in bioluminescence from implantation, whereas for the dual treated, you can see there's an initial decrease, then a plateauing, and then a slow increase. So we thought there was tumor slowing uh, and increased survival for group three medulloblastoma. So uh, interestingly, because we saw all the mice were succumbing eventually, so in other words, six weeks of treatment, whilst it delayed tumor and improved survival, they clearly didn't cure these mice. We thought, well, are the mice becoming resistant to this combination? Because remember, we're stopping it. Part, really, we're stopping it because six weeks is about as much as we could give the mice because of hematotoxicity. And the short answer shown by this, so what we did is we took the cells out uh, and at the end of the experiments and grew them in culture and then did some viability studies and these graphs show basically that there was no difference between the pre-implant and after the, the treatment. And this is showing that for two separate uh, patient-derived cell lines, D283 and D425. So uh, resistance was not a factor that we identified. Um, now, we then wanted to test also, so this is arguably not arguably, this is actually the worst of the subgroups. It, thankfully, it's, it's rare. Uh, hedgehog in general do actually okay, but if you've got this P53 mutation, uh, which often these kids have got Leframani, but not exclusively, they're usually a little bit older than your classical um, child with hedgehog disease. So hedgehog disease is a very developmental disorder, and it's usually in the infants or in the other end of the spectrum in adults. Uh, Different mutations occur in them, and it's beautiful work that um, Brandon has been part of in characterizing this. But in children with the, the P53, you usually can pick them from. They've got nodular desmoplastic disease. It's usually cerebellar located in the in the in the lobe as opposed to the vermis, and they're usually about six or seven years old. And then you you get like a shiver down your spine because you you know these kids are not going to do well. Generally, we believe this is an incurable disease. There may be some odd survivors around, but it is a dreadful disease. The last patient I had with this relapsed one month after his first cycle of chemotherapy, which comes six weeks after radiation. So that is very unusual for a kid to relapse so early on after such powerful treatment. And the disease was unstoppable. We threw everything at it and it, it just... It, just progressed. And that is the experience of other clinicians around the world. And we see here that these Kaplan-Meier curves are nowhere near. <laughs> In fact, they're unimpressive. Um, underwhelming, I think, would be um, the, your, your response. There is, though, if you tease them out, there is a signal of activity, but it's nothing like the other curve. So we can see that in hedgehog disease, the combination of prexassertive and cyclophosphamide seems to have some activity in that we're getting some improvement in survival, but it's nowhere near like we saw for the group freeze. And to see it, you really have to tease the curves apart. And it's mostly in combination, not with what we have set the bar at, is where you compare it to chemo by itself as the, as the real control, but actually to vehicle where the kid, the, the, not the kids, the mice are not getting any uh, proper treatment. And you can see also the BLI in the graph shows that there's a definite decrease in the bioluminescence. But overall, it's a much less compelling argument that this combination for hedgehog uh, is effective. So that's the cyclophosphamide story. We found it was very good for uh, augmenting the effect of cyclodeprexacertib in group three and seemed to have some efficacy, but not massive in the group, um, uh, hedgehog group. Now, I've already shown this graph earlier on. This is how we're currently treating the kids in Perth using Uncle Amar's study. And I've already told you that pemetrexate, gemcitabine are currently being tested for their efficacy in the frontline setting. And I also showed you that gemcitabine came up in our drug screen independently. So this seemed the most obvious other chemi um, chemotherapy DNA damaging drug to test in our 
a pipeline with Prexacertib. And again, these graphs are going to be similar to the last ones. It's the same thing, multiple mouse models tested in different labs around the globe. And again, showing an improvement in survival and similarly uh, slowing of tumor growth as is depicted by the BLI, which I've just shown here um, as photos. So we found again, uh, Prexacertib was efficacious in group three medulloblastoma. Uh, and I haven't gone into all the different types of models, but some are patient derived cell lines, some are PDX models like MB002 and MIC P53DD. That's a model that Rob Wetzler developed, which is a mouse model of MIC driven medulloblastoma with a double negative P53. Um, and uh, MB. 870 is another PDX model. So a variety of models, basically. However, when we looked at medulloblastoma of the hedgehog subgroup with the P53 mutant, so not, it's now depicted as alpha medulloblastoma, that's its name that it's been given. So the, the worst of the worst, we saw no efficacy with gemcitabine. Um, in, you know, there was a hint in one model, a slight, slight uh, p-value, but by and large, no efficacy, even when we tease the curves apart, and no evidence of any efficacy by bioluminescence. And in fact, Martin had reported that um, gemcitabine was not efficacious in, in cernic hedgehog disease in a cancer cell publication now back in 2014. So this kind of validated what she'd already seen that in the hedgehog model, really we're not seeing any efficacy of gemcitabine. So Summarize this work. I think I'm doing okay on time, Fernando. I'm not seeing anybody. Brandon's not waggling his finger at me or anything. So, and I'm coming towards the end now. So, I hope I've shown you that um, drug screening identified check one, check two inhibitors as novel candidate therapy for medulloblastoma. I've shown you that we did in vitro synergism testing, showing that these multiple different check one, check two inhibitors. Uh, that we tested, they all enhanced the DNA damaging effects of cyclophosphamide. I have not shown you the data for cisplatinum. We did extensive work on cisplat. By the long and the short is it does work in cisplat, but it's just nowhere near as effective as in cyclo and gemcitabine in, in order of enhancing um, survival in the mice. Um, and then I've shown you that in mouse models, we've, we tried our best to validate in as many mouse models as we can get our paws on. And we tried the different types of mouse models. So implanted cell lines, PDXs, mouse transplantation models. That's that P53 double negative that I showed you, Rob Wexerea. We even did a, a genetically engineered mouse model. I've not shown you that data because we didn't do survival studies uh, because you can't do luciferase in those models because they're genetically engineered. Uh, it's the Smoothen model that actually Andrew Hallahan created in, so it all shows this family connections in, um, in, uh, in the Olson lab in Seattle and, um, and Andrew is at Brisbane Children's. Now he, he turned out to end up as a bone marrow transplanter, God only knows why, because he was a brain tumor doctor really, but now he's become like chief executive or something like he's like the highest up in the food chain. So I claim to know a very famous person in your institutions there, uh, but I still fondly say to him, you can always come and visit your mouse model anytime you want Andrew in Perth, because we have it here. Um, so he created that Andrew Hallahan back in sort of the mid 2000s, um, in the Olson lab. Um, then we did extensive pharmacodynamic studies. Uh, I showed you target inhibition down of the both check one and the downstream effector of CDC2. I showed you inhibition of the DNA damage response. I showed you increased tumor cell apoptosis and reduced tumor cell proliferation all in vivo in both group three medulloblastoma and also in the hedgehog. Um, but in terms of survival and bioluminescence, I showed you significantly delayed tumor growth in vivo and prolonged animal survival, which was very strong evidence in of efficacy in the group three with both cyclo and gem, but not so good in the hedgehog P53 mutant models where they, I think that really it's a signal of activity with cyclophosphamide, but no signal with gemcitabine, uh, much less compelling than in the group three. Oh, there's Brandon. So that's how 
we developed the clinical trial based completely on this preclinical data. And like I said, there's currently 12, 13 patients being treated on that trial. Uh, the majority have actually been on the cyclical arms. We've had some issues with the GEM arm in terms of toxicity. Uh, so we've got an amendment that is just being approved, but um, it basically is being tested to see if these kids will tolerate it. And does it have any early efficacy signal? That's the 1B component of the trial. Now, St. Jude Elliot, really, I, we don't want that to be the, the end, of course. We want that to be the start, the beginning of this pipeline journey of trying to feed the clinical trials pipeline with drugs that we have tested as best as we can in the preclinical setting so that we increase the chances of taking combinations or drugs into the clinic that have got the best chance of um, improving survival uh, for these children and hopefully decreasing side effects. So I already alluded or said about Brandon working with palbociclib, which is a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and we have collaborating very closely. This project is led by Brandon, but we're doing tons of work to do very similar to what we've done with Prexa with CDK4-6 to get the level of evidence where I as a clinician will feel comfortable and can sleep at night that we've done our very best to take the best compounds forward into the clinic. Whether they work or not, that's what the clinical trial will determine, but that we've done our very best so that uh, we're not treating kids with drugs that I've got no chance of any hope. Uh, and the, Brandon also mentioned about this machine, which you guys I think are putting in a, uh, letter of support for. Currently, uh, we had, we were the first to get one, I think, in the Southern Hemisphere. There may have been somewhere in China that got it before us. Um, but in the Southern Hemisphere, we're certainly the first in Australia. I believe there's another group over East that have got one now. So I've already told you radiation is the most important weapon in this disease. It's very, very effective, but it's very, very damaging. And so... Um, Previously, we've not been able to do radiation experiments with mice because we just didn't have the precision equipment to treat the mice like we treat the kids. It was too crude, but now we do. We can essentially give radiation to these mice like we do to the children, which is amazing. But these are 750,000 plus dollar machines. Now, um, they're not cheap, but look, ours just never rest. And in fact, Brandon sent one of his um, scientists over to do some of the experiments for the CDK4-6 over in Perth. Um, but it would be nice if uncle got his own machine. So do write a letter of support for him. He, he deserves it. He's a good lad. Um, this is just to show you how powerful radiation is. I mean, it melts tumors away. Uh, and so it's obvious that we should be testing these DNA damaging repair pathway inhibitors in the setting of the most DNA damaging treatment that exists, which is radiation, in the hope that if we increase its effectiveness, we can decrease the dose and some of its side effects, hopefully. And this is just some data showing you that, yes, it does work in combination with Prexa, but I won't labor these experiments. Uh, I just wanted to thank our funders again, uh, including obviously our patients and our families for, for whom none of this work could happen without. And these are our international collaborators that were involved in this particular project. And I've mentioned many of them as I've gone along.